These are the planes that won wars. Proud veterans of the days when heroes fought in the skies. They're like time machines. It seems you grab the controls, you've got that instant touch back to the past. In hangars and workshops across Britain, engineers and enthusiasts are fighting a desperate duel against corrosion. It's only glued on. I'm sure it'll be all right. And the clock. I'll be pretty gutted if we don't make it. Their mission? To return historic military aircraft to the skies. The hardest thing is finding the parts. From D-Day vets to jump jets. As a little lad, you go, mum, 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 can I have another fix kit? Bloody fantastic. From legendary lifesavers to Edwardian flying machines. I've been told I can only fly it as high as I'm prepared to fall. But it can be an unpredictable business. If we have a catastrophic failure, then come and try and rescue us. You're taking off thinking, if the engine stops, we're even a land. I mean, I've had three engine failures. It takes serious money. You need a cool three to six million pounds to get a good spare part. And total dedication. Minus 28. Some of the tools are freezing up. 15 minutes of holding a screwdriver. You can't feel your fingers. This time on Warbird Workshop, two rare relics of the 1930s are prepared to fly again. That's as dead as a doornail. For a team of young pilots determined to keep old warplanes up where they belong. You've got a 100 mile an hour wind buffeting you, all the noise of the engine right in front of you. It's quite a sensation. With the help of a veteran engineer. And now you get these guys, all they do is sit there and twiddle a button and turn the radios. They're not flying a bloody aeroplane anymore. The wild coast of Northumberland has been the backdrop of battle since the days of the Viking raiders. And in the 1940s, it was home to the RAF's biggest Spitfire school, training pilots to fly the legendary fighter. But now, on the wartime airfield at Eschot, a team of young pilots are determined to bring back the base's glorious past. So the plans for the place really is turning it into a bit of a working museum. For us, it's all about having interesting vehicles, interesting aeroplanes, and being something we can actually share with people as well. I don't like having aircraft in the corner that, that don't fly anymore. Everything that's here is going to fly. We'll have events, and really just to bring everyone in and see the airfield, see the aeroplanes, would be a really special thing. Airfield owners Sam Woodgate and Richard Pike are assembling a squadron of vintage warplanes like this Oyster Spotter aircraft that flew in the Korean War. Friend and airline pilot James Arnott will help fly them. So it's been offline for quite a while while we're heading through all the work, but we're finally getting there. Um, a lot of the delay has been actually waiting on parts because things are really hard to get hold of. Now the team are about to buy another rare warbird and borrow a second. We've got our eye on two aircraft down at Wickenby, an naval aircraft N3N, which has been under restoration for a number of years, which is, is a monster. And there's also the Moran Sonia MS315, which is a very rare aircraft, and it's one of three in the world. The two new planes will be restored 150 miles away on this airfield in Lincolnshire by veteran engineer Jerry Cooper and his assistant, Lewis. Right, here we go then. Today, they're unloading the Moran Sonier MS315, a pre-war French fighter trainer that's just arrived on a trailer. <laughs> get it off, get it off, and get the wheels back on it so that we can manoeuvre it. Because it's a bit of a big old thing to have hanging around with the wheels on. <laughs> Jerry trained as an engineer in the RAF, became a pilot, and has been restoring historic aircraft for a living for 20 years. Some dating back to the First World War. We've done it so many times now, we just don't think about it, you know. Everything that's in this hangar has been trailered. In fact, uh, this came in from France. We brought this in from France, trailered it. There's only three of these in the world. It's had a dramatic life. One hot day two years ago, it was at the center of a life or death emergency over the holiday beaches of Devon. That doesn't sound good, does no, it? No, he's landing on the beach and they better clear. What happened next was captured on camera by holidaymakers. Holy oh, people, you better clear the beach. With total engine failure, the pilot has seconds to find a patch of shingle clear of tourists. 
They had to drag it right up the beach until they just, just got it high the tide, at the high tide mark and started dismantling it to get it out of the way. Everybody walked away from it. It's when, it's when they don't walk away from it, you worry. Now Jerry and Lewis must rebuild the damaged plane and remove all traces of its dramatic landing. It landed on a pebble beach. And inside here, we've got a pebble stuck and the actual V part there. I suppose there's what? At least, there's at least sort of over half a ton on it, I would think, at the moment. The first stage of the rebuild is to lift the fuselage and put it back on its wheels. Now you're getting the weight off it. That's OK. You're off, aren't you? We get the chain off it, move this out of the way, and then we get a crane, and we'll lift one side at a time, put the wheel on. The team must examine every component for crash damage, but there's remarkably little. Yeah, so basically, that's it. Jerry makes the next stage sound simple. We'll put it together, put all the panels and things back on it, get the battery charged up. Then we're ready for the wings. We haven't got any brakes to worry about, nothing like that. Just a bit of grease around everywhere, make sure all the controls at the back are working and, uh, and all the cables are tensioned correctly, and off we go. Back in Northumberland, Sam and Richard are hard at work raising the money to pay for the restorations. They are borrowing with the Moran from Jerry, but buying the big N3N biplane and selling fuel to weekend flyers is a major part of their business. Sam is basically my best friend. We've spent uh, the last five years pretty much not being separated for a minute of the day building up our business together. We both met when we were learning to fly and we bounce off each other really well. He certainly got strengths that I haven't got and that's why we're a very good pair in business and it's worked out very well. Okay. The team believes it's time Eschert's rich history was recognised. The site originates from the war. It was a Spitfire base. To have such a historic airfield with historic aeroplanes would be fantastic. They want to use some of their old planes to give pleasure flights over Northumberland's holiday coast. The next step for us is it's sort of showing those aircraft to people who wouldn't normally have got a chance to see them, because a lot of these things are just tucked away and, and they don't get seen, and that's, that's really sad. And airline pilot James can't wait to test fly their new warbirds. It's a full audio-visual experience. It can be quite overwhelming as well. Uh, you know, you've got a 100-mile-hour wind buffeting you as well, uh, all the noise of the engine right in front of you. Um, it, it, it's, it's quite a sensation. Back in Wickenby, Jerry is juggling work on both planes destined for Eschert. The N3N is the biggest challenge. It was manufactured in 42. The Navy used it to, to train their pilots for their fleet. This one went to Pensacola, spent all the war years in Pensacola, and at the end, I think it was about 46, 47, it was put up for sale. And it went to a cross frame company who took the original engine out, put a big 450 horse Pratt & Whitney in it, big wheels off a BT-17, and uh, off it went cross frame. George Bush was trained in one before he went on to torpedo bombers. They, they do have a story to tell. It usually takes about 10 hours instruction in the air to fit a cadet for going it alone. The float plane version of the N3N helped train thousands of American naval aviators for the bloody war in the Pacific following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. It, it has been completely stripped back to the bones. In fact, we must have took pounds and pounds of dust from, from Arizona out of it. There was some rot in the back end of it, you know, from when it crop sprayed, so that, all that was rebuilt. We've completely restored all the fabric on it, and we're now finding new instruments for it. And, uh, I mean, the top wing is a complete wing, so you get two cranes to lift it up high enough to get it on top of the aeroplane again. Next thing is we'll paint it first, and then we'll start plumbing it up, and uh, then the lads can start putting all their markings on it to put it back to how it was when it went uh, when it went to war, basically. But there are problems on the horizon. De Marin's Gallic design annoys Jerry. When it comes to aeroplanes, nothing simple with the French. And in the spray bay, 
a colourful gate crasher threatens the N3N's flawless finish. Sam, he's down there, mate. Can you see him? At Eshot Airfield in Northumberland, pilots Richard and Sam are about to head south to Lincolnshire to help out on the two vintage planes they are having restored. We have two little Taylor monoplanes, um, VW powered, VW engine straight up a Beetle on the front, nice and cheap to run. It's uh, about one hour fifty in the monoplane, whereas it's about three and a half hours in a car. So the only limitation is I can just about take a sandwich in the back. Richard and Sam are wingmen in more ways than one. It's quite strange, obviously. Your best friend is also your business partner, so we'll go away from the airfield and then we'll still go and have a beer together. The girlfriends always say that we see each other more than, than they see us. That would be good afternoon to you. It's uh, Golf Bravo Delta Alpha Golf in formation with Golf Bravo Delta Alpha Delta. The plane's new operators are arriving to paint the N3N and restore its wartime markings. So what's the plan today? We just had the yellow applied um, to the, uh, the wings and the tail currently. So we're just in the process of putting on the US Navy markings for the aircraft at the minute. We've just got to wait for the fuselage to be painted and the bottom wing as well. Uh, we'll be doing those uh, in a little while. And then once that's done, it's basically making sure that all the inside of the airplane's kitted out properly, that all the instrument panels uh, are fully configured again. Among the Navy's planes, None is more famous than the N3M, the primary trainer affectionately known as the Yellow Peril. They really were built like a tank, uh, and they do all sorts of crazy things with them. They actually ended up being the, the last biplane in service uh, with the US forces. That's the numbers for the side, 228. They only have old photos as a guide to where to paint the serial numbers and America's red, white and blue Navy stars. And just come under there. Yep we'll spray red, so they're going to be painted red, and we'll paint a big red section in the middle of this mask. On top of this mask, there'll then be the next mask, which will cover over just the red, so we'll leave a red circle in the middle. So the red gets covered, spray the white, then the white gets covered with the star, and we paint the blue. It's going to be a long job, waiting for coats of paint to dry, so the customers are going to get stuck in and lend engineer Jerry a hand. Strapped to Jerry's trailer are the Morin's wings, retrieved from a barn in Devon, where they've been stored since the accident. How many do you need, Jerry? Four? Huh? It's four enough? What? Four yeah, 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 yeah. Clonk, come on, do your bit, clonk. The wings are covered in fragile fabric and require gentle handling. It's a huge wing. This is a rare bird. It's 1932. There are only three of them left of this model. Um, one in Switzerland, one in France, and this one here. Tomorrow, work starts on reattaching the wings. It'll be a big job. And Jerry must get to the bottom of the fault that led to that emergency landing on the beach. It had a bit of a contretemps about fuel consumption. So we need to do some fuel consumption tests, and then it'll be issued with its permit. That is brilliant. Back in the spray bay, the first coats of paint have dried, and the US Navy stars are emerging from the masking film on the N3N. But it's not flown for, for decades, so it's, uh, I'm sure it's very excited to get back in the air. And when you're striving for paint perfection, even the smallest problem can spoil things. <laughs> He's not going to go now. Come on. <laughs> if you do paint work properly, you will get something go wrong and it'll be something like a butterfly landing in it after you've finished. Sam, he's down there, mate. Can you see him? He, he's stuck in the corner under the wing. Thankfully, <laughs> the butterfly makes an escape. No, now, now he's gone. He's gone. Yeah, he's gone. 24 hours later, the N3N is back in uniform after 75 years in civvies. Yes. On the hangar floor, Jerry is about to attach the wings to the Morin's fuselage. Wow. 
Okay, guys, I'm pulling it round. Hang on, hang on, you're on the fabric. Each wing must be precisely positioned. On the leading edge off. And the hangar dog Ben's watchful eye. You'll be lying underneath the aeroplane doing something, and then you'll just feel this sort of nuzzling in the side of you, and a big tongue coming and giving you a lick as you're working away underneath. A bit of a gentle giant. I could do with a hammer or a Lewis must align metal lugs on the wings with matching holes on the fuselage struts, then drive bolts into place. Podger? Where's the podger? Yeah, I'm waiting for it to line up. Let's go up on the leading edge. Right, just a sec. We're trying to get the main bolts in on the main plane. Yeah. Um, different from most aeroplanes, this has got two in the root, in the root, and then two struts. So what we're trying to do is get the two top bolts in so that we can get the rest of the aeroplane to move and go from there. Nothing simple with the French. When it comes to aeroplanes, okay, if I saw a French engineer or designer, I wouldn't pee on him if he was on fire. I'm in. But eventually, both ends meet. That's it. Jerry owns the Moran, and he's lending it to the Escher team. He thinks planes stay in better shape if they're flown regularly. I'm looking forward to seeing it fly. The lads at Yeshuk can have it because they're looking for old stuff, and uh, I've just reminded them that um, if anybody likes it and are interested in it, it's for sale. <laughs> As you can see, I've too many already. It's taking longer than expected. We've got another one on this side to go, and then we'll put the front two in. It could be very late today, the way it's going. As you can see, looking at it now, it's leaning. Just, just, the one, just the one wing on it now has put the other side up about a foot and a half. So if you think we had problems this side, wait until we get the other wing on. Now more holes must be lined up. Ready? Yeah, wouldn't you, are? Oh, you I think it was pulled apart in a bit of a rush because the tide was coming in. So consequently, everything is not, it's not how we normally take an aeroplane apart carefully and mark it all and all the rest of it. So we're now stuck with a bit of a Chinese puzzle. All right, nice, now relax, go on. Yeah. Relax. There you go, scene. Just, just keep there. It's an absolute to work on. It's a new chapter in the Moran's eventful life. In 1940, she was being flown by the French Air Force. When the Germans invaded, her pilots dismantled her and hid the pieces in barns. Jerry rescued the remains 20 years ago. I found it in a shed in the back of a hangar, and I'm a bit of a, a fool for old aeroplanes, especially when they're just lying rotting. So I brought it back, but the wings had been stored in water at some stage, so it was all semi-rotten, and uh, the fuselage was just four sticks and some wires. Wing forward, please, wing forward, wing forward, wing forward. Restoring the plane was a family affair. My daughter and myself worked on it and put it back together. Push, in. She was the driving force behind it, really. And, and she used to help me with the stringing and, and the doping and all this sort of thing. And uh, I, she used to tell me off terribly because I used to shy away from it. And used to drag me back to do another, just do another rib, just do another rib, Dad, you know. And, oh. Murder because it was standing up on its edge or on its leading edge, six foot high, you know. And to try and get, you know, I had to pass the needle through and get it back and knot it, and it was murder. But then we did it. Hitting it upside down. Jerry's daughter hand painted the plane's distinctive logo. Sadly, she died soon after the plane flew again, and Jerry sees the Moran as part of her legacy. Now both wings are back on the Morang. It's time for Jerry to turn his attention to the N3N biplane's engine, a pre-war American radial with a reputation for being bomb-proof. I've come across in my life I mean, engines that have thrown a barrel. The barrel's completely off and still carry on running. It's incredible what they'll do until they pour all the oil out and then things go wrong, but they will carry on running. In the 1930s, engine makers vied to build a reputation for reliability. Most Pratt & Whitney's you come across have this emblem on them, but most of the emblems are missing because Pratt & Whitney always put um, a silver dollar behind the emblem 
and every thousandth engine, they put a gold one in. Much of the N3N is still a pile of components stripped out 20 years ago when Jerry bought the plane in America. But he knows where each goes. It's rare to find someone with so much experience. I'm pretty sure he's surveyed much all of the world, really, at some point. But what he doesn't know isn't worth knowing, really. It's a skill built on a lifetime in the cockpit. Every time we go down, there's a different story. You know, we're just learning as much as we can from him. We operate the next RAF Argus again, Zaire. 4,000 feet above sea level, the actual end of the runway was a cliff face. There's an absolute gold mine down there, uh, and it's quite a privilege to be involved with it. Just be around him and just picking up some of the stories of what he's done in the past. We're at 24,000 feet over eastern Turkey where all the mountains are. There's fire going on, there's shouting fire. But what had happened was his pipe had turned upside down and then the ash had dropped inside his bloody sleeping bag. He's got sort of 4,000 hours just crop dusting, let alone everything else. So, um, yeah, really experienced guy. Had a few engine failures uh, and uh, only had one serious when I got picked up by a dust devil and I got thrown through a row of trees. They went green and noisy for a while and came out the other side and the leading edges were like sawtooth and it was still flying, so it just carried on. That was the best days of flying. Now you get these guys, they spend a bloody fortune, okay, it's because they want to be an airline pilot, and when they get there, all they do is sit there and twiddle a button and turn the radio frequencies, and it's about it. They're not flying a bloody airplane anymore. He'll need all his experience for the challenge that lies ahead, coaxing life back into the engine. That's as dead as a doornail. It's late spring at Wickenby, and in Jerry's hangar, it's a big day for the Moran. It's time to run the engine and test the fuel system, blamed for its dramatic landing on a holiday beach two years ago. It's a modern replacement for its original pre-war power plant. The engines for this were Solmsons, and they stopped making Solmsons when France was overrun by the Germans. And at the end of the war, they never went back into production. What are you doing that for? I'm just going to rotate it. Jerry believes in authenticity. He chose a modern Australian engine because of its old-fashioned shape. It looks more unique on old aeroplanes. All right, I mean, you get a lot of World War I aeroplanes now that are being built, but they have Lycoming four-cylinder or six-cylinder engines hidden in them. Whereas with this, you know, you've got, a, you've got a radial engine, so you've got cylinders sticking out, you know, got the round front face of it, so, yeah. Ready again, one push. It weighs nearly a ton. Watch that wing tip, please, Jim. Thank you. Ready? Yep. Right, Paul, we are about to receive. So, master switch on, fuel pump on, okay? And fuel pump off for a second. Okay, then we're just going to turn it over for a few seconds. Clear prop! But the engine is reluctant to fire. Oh! as a doornail. Luis and Jerry suspect the battery. Oh, sorry about that. That was a bit of a non-starter. Perhaps a trickle charger will do the trick. Yeah. And it's third time lucky. It fires up nicely. A big puff of smoke like, like radials do. In here, look, everything's, everything's right. We've got oil pressure. We've got temperatures coming up. Good fuel pressure. In fact, the fuel pressure's sitting there at the moment. And, um, yeah, cylinder head temperature, all that lots. Everything's good on it. It's been a long project for the whole team. Two years. Must be two years, easily. So, uh, yeah, it's amazing. It's another restoration, almost complete. The team are turning their attention back to the N3N biplane. Installing the engine controls and the sensor that supplies information to the pilot's airspeed indicator is the next task for Lewis. We're going to be doing all the piping work to these gauges. 
So before I can put all the piping to the back of them, it's, it's good to clean them all up, make sure they're all cleaned and prepped. It checks for uh, any defects, anything that's possibly wrong with them. Uh, I'm currently securing the pito and the pito static lines that run from the fuselage into the wing. Access. Access is the main problem, especially when it comes to aircraft. Anything aircraft related is always access. I've got to get my arm through a gap. It's probably about three, four inches wide. And then pinch some wire, which normally would be a really easy job. There is, a, there is, a, there is a, a type thing on there. There's a name on the bloody thing somewhere, because we've had that out before. Huh? Finding spares isn't easy or cheap. Jerry's wife, Jenny, spends hours looking for them. Jerry finds out all the bits that are needed. He'll, uh, he'll talk to Jen. And Jen has a fantastic ability of finding things. We need bolts to hold the fairings on. If we buy them in this country, they're 47 pence each, and we want about 280 odd. But if we go and get them from the States, they're seven cents, which is ridiculous, because that's about 5p. There are quite a few people now that are starting to pull these old aeroplanes out of barns and things, and out of workshops. So yeah, it's, it's, it's knowing, where to, knowing where to look and where to go for it. But the Wickenby team don't just do this for money. Everyone has that, that, that passion for something that they love doing. And, uh, light aircraft and um, old aircraft. And the unique things are just what I, I love doing. I just enjoy it. Um, I can't see myself doing much else, I'm honest with you. Have that. I got anywhere that I can put my foot? No. The huge fuel tank holds 40 gallons but it hasn't been checked since the 1970s. Twist it through 90 degrees. It was put in before it was serviced, so we're, uh, we're just taking it out to make sure. We're looking to see if there's any corrosion inside it, you know, any, any dirt and rubbish inside it. But there's a problem. To get it out, Lewis must first remove part of the instrument panel. These things are sent to try us. Well, most things aircraft are easier said than done. I've got it. Okay. And then I will come around again and take it from the other side. Jerry's in his late 70s, but he has no plans to retire. Just slow down a little. I've done enough damn flying. I'll get my kick now out of putting all the aeroplanes back in the air. So once I know it's not going to kill anybody and I'm happy with it, then I'll move on to the next one. <laughs> it's been opened up. OK, and it's been opened up, so the previous, previous people that had it have had it opened up and so they could look inside and see what's going on. Old sediment or a loose piece of metal inside the tank could cause an unsurvivable crash. Inside, there could be a serious setback. Uh, Golf Alpha, Golf from Golf Alpha Delta. Can't wait to see the progress on the N3N. Yeah, what do you think they're going to have done? Much progress? The Escher team are heading south again. It's six months since Richard and Sam started negotiations to borrow the Moran. Since they last saw it four weeks ago, its wings have been attached and it is ready to fly. Wow, OK. That's looking fantastic. Well, wow. it's huge. Are you going to climb in? Let's give it a go. Oh, that's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. It's actually a really, really long way up. That. After their tiny monoplanes, they're going up in the world. It's a really big cockpit. There's loads of room in here. Yeah. And I genuinely don't know what any of this says, so... Do you speak French? I don't know. Let's leave it down here. That's the emergency fuel tank release. Yeah. So we don't touch that. Yeah. We're clear at the back there? Yeah, It looks really nice. Really excited to give it a go. And um, we'll see how it flies. For Richard and Sam, it's a dream that began with a chance meeting. We were actually approached by Jerry, who said, um, I've got a strange aeroplane that's looking for a home for, for some time. We said, oh, what's that then? Oh, it's a Moran MS315. Same reaction as everyone else. What on earth's that? Never heard of it before. Um, and then obviously, of course, went on Google, looked at the registration, wow, 
that's amazing. Uh, and instantly went back and said, yeah, fantastic. Um, so from there, you know, sort of falling in love with, with what it is. The Morin will share a hangar with her American cousin, the N3N biplane, which the team are buying for a high five-figure sum. They've been working on the oil system at the moment. They have been busy. All the instruments are going in. Next task is reinstalling the plane's ignition system and its magneto switch, which provides power to the spark plugs. Yeah, it goes clonk, clonk. <laughs> so hopefully we're going to completely overhaul that. It's not going to be a cheap plane to operate. We have our small tailor monoplanes. They burn 9, 10 litres an hour, um, nice and efficient. This is polar opposite. This just throws fuel straight out the exhaust, essentially. We think it'll probably be somewhere in the region of 70 to 80 litres an hour. But if we're doing aerobatics, the consumption's going to be considerably higher. And that means the fuel alone could cost £150 an hour. But Sam's still looking forward to seeing it fired up. This engine had been inhibited many years ago and it hasn't turned. So it will be the first time in a number of years it's, it's actually run. It's going to be a very, very smoky start. And I think there's a lot of people that want to come and see. It's summer and after seven months' work, the Morang is now ready to fly. So the plan is take her up, come back and check how much fuel she's using. Uh, and then that'll all get submitted onto the paperwork and sent off. And then hopefully we'll get the permit through soon after, and then we can take her home. Airline pilot James will be at the controls as it takes off into the skies over Lincolnshire. He'll be cruising at barely 60 miles an hour, rather slower than the other planes around here. You've got the red arrows sort of fairly close to us there, lots and lots of jets flying around, lots of training going on. So yeah, you're going to have uh, eyes on sticks, as I say, just uh, looking around the cockpit all the time. It's unique. Uh, that's the big draw to it. I mean, currently she's the only airworthy one in the world. There are another couple uh, with the original engine, but they're rather unreliable and parts are very scarce to come by, so they hardly ever fly, and I don't think they're flying at the moment. This test flight isn't without risk. The Morale's emergency landing on the beach apparently happened when the pilot ran out of fuel after just half an hour in the air. There may still be a fault, despite work to modify the fuel system. We've done a fair bit of engine ground running, now we need it in the air so that it can do what it normally does and cruise around what it normally does and uh, we can then check it after the end of each hour and see how much fuel it has used. Okay, mags on. So, mags on, pull, your, pull the thing pull out. The tip. Yep. And... James will be staying close to the airfield as a precaution. The risks are real. Oil pressure is coming up nicely now. So if we're all clear, we'll, uh, we'll move off. OK, runway's clear ahead. Here comes the tail. If the engine or the fuel system fail again, James will have seconds to find a field. And we're airborne. And perform a dangerous emergency landing. This is a real test flight. I can feel her being blown with the wind. Not the fastest machine in the world. Jerry's happy. A new generation of pilots shares his passion for keeping old warbirds in the sky, even if most modern flyers don't. They like putting their nice flying suits on and going flying at the weekend. It doesn't suit their image if they got streaky oil covered flying suits. But it's good, it's, 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 it's real flying, and so it should be. That's all rather relaxing, really. The main thing we're trying to do is cruise, so we want to get an hour in the cruise. We'll probably stay within sort of 10, 15 minutes of the actual airfield and a bit of a radius around, you know, just in case any little hiccup stops happening, we can get back quickly. Usually James flies a Boeing 737. Today, he's trying to get the hang of 1930s air travel. Beastly wind today with a bit of a headwind at the moment. Ground speed around 45 knots. It'll be exciting, but you've just got that sense that you want to look after it and, and be gentle with it. And that first time that you fly it, you know, you've got that in your mind. 2,000 feet up, James is finding beauty in this ungainly pre-war relic. A lovely swept back parasol wing. That's good turning ability. I'll put one in to demonstrate. Uh, 
there's Whittenby again. After 45 minutes in the air, it's time to head back to the runway. Most pleasant. A few little lumps and bumps, cloud bases around about 1900-ish feet. The good news is the Moran's fuel problems appear to have been solved. There's still plenty left in the tank. The book figure says about 27 litres an hour, uh, so I haven't found out exactly what it was yet, but uh, it, it wouldn't be too far off. And that's pretty economical, really. I think she's a 150 horsepower engine, uh, so it's not bad going. See, it's using what we thought it was going to use, but just under 30 litres an hour. And uh, yeah, it's nice to have it back in the air again. They're like time machines. As soon as you, you sit in them and you, you grab the controls, you've got that instant tactile touch back to the past. The team must now fly another five hours of test flights before the Moran is signed off as airworthy. For Jerry, it's time to turn back to the big biplane and get it back into the air for the first time in 40 years. At Wickenby, the team are starting the last lap in the marathon restoration of the N3N biplane. The fuel tank proved a bigger problem than Lewis expected. What we've done is removed the original primer and we've found an area of corrosion up on the top here. So the corrosion was removed and we've, um, we've replated the top section, as you can see. I don't think this one's been used in gone 60 years. So it's rather important that we test it and make sure that it holds. Within, within, a, within a couple of weeks, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to turn this over and fire it up. We'll get the fuselage tank back in uh, and then hopefully run it. And she's going to be the most powerful aircraft on the LAA register at the minute, the, um, the 985, generating 450 horsepower. So it may take a little while to get the paperwork done. And then hopefully looking to uh, test fly and get the permit issued in the spring. That's the front. That's what I'm getting at, yeah. yeah, that's the oh, front. Okay. It's time to reinstall the fuel tank. As you can see, it's a bit of a lump to get in. It's a tight fit, with only centimetres to spare. Unless it comes up perfectly vertical and drops down through, you never get it in. It needs to go down in front of that strap there. You just ease your side panel out, and it's going down. Huh? That's it. For Lewis, this veteran of the Second World War is a time machine. Now this is, what, 1943 and 1996, and the amount of souls have been in and out of this, learning everything they know. You can put the tank straps on now, yeah. Just the electrics and the fuel system to connect before the engine can be fired up for the first time. And uh, <laughs> just wait for the bang. I still have to warn the police because it's, you know, they smoke screen over and bloody Lincolnshire when it fires up. <laughs> In the skies over Yorkshire, there's an unusual sight. The Moran is going home. In formation with Richard and Sam. Looking at it now, you wouldn't even know what year it was. Look at it, it just looks so old. It does look really old. It almost looks like something from the First World War. I feel like I'm seeing it in black and white as I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. It looks like something out of a, a 1930s poster, doesn't it? <laughs> it's beautiful. It's 150 miles to Northumberland and the team's base at Eshwood Airfield. And at this speed, it'll be a long haul, almost three hours. So what speed we got here on the ground? I mean, we've got 65 in the air. Yeah, 65. Well, with that headwind, we're probably we're about 60 miles an hour, probably. For airline pilot James, it's a chance to reflect on the Moran's romantic past in pre-war France. It's a 1932 aeroplane, this one. It, it feels, you know, really that you're taking it back in time. You know, just when, you know, flying was all new and exciting. It is mad to think it is the only flying one left anywhere. Hidden under the noses of the occupying Germans, only to be abandoned for decades in a leaking hangar, the Moran story is now entering another chapter. Yeah, she was in a hell of a state when Jerry found her after the war, and, and look at her now, perfect. 
absolutely brilliant. Uh, she's a survivor, really. Back in Lincolnshire, Jerry's hit a big setback on the big biplane. This, the, the bit that's missing goes on here. Goes on, on there, okay, underneath. We're waiting for uh, a carburetor scoop to come so that we can connect up the, uh, the inlet air. It's, this thing's so powerful that when we try and run it, it, if we didn't have a scoop and a filter on it, would suck all the rubbish underneath the airplane up in, into it. It means the N3N will not be joining them around in Northumberland for some time. I, I'm not going to turn the key on it until it's right. But one long forgotten relic of aviation history is now back where she belongs, in the air. Well, this is my toy shop. I love taking a heap of rubbish or a heap of tubes or a heap of, you know, a piece of wood, okay, and, and turn it into an airplane. So you think I know, okay, um, <laughs> I'm not anything else. I'm not bothered about anything else, you know. As you can see, I'm surrounded by airplanes. I'm in heaven. And in her new hangar, the Moran is turning heads, slowly. I think it's because it's so old, people find it so fascinating. Um, and obviously with it being unique, that's great as well. But lumbering is probably the word I would use still, and it's, it's quite laboured. Uh, but then once it gets going, uh, and you've worked out quite what you need to do with your feet, because it seems to do things that other aeroplanes don't do. But once you've worked it out, it's great. And um, you can just have a lovely relaxing flight with it and just sort of float around in this sort of big armchair, basically. It's, it's brilliant. Everyone loves it here. The, the sort of reception in Northumberland when it came was fantastic because no one had seen anything like that up here. It's very rare in Northumberland to have such a historic aeroplane. Um, so we found people just turning up to come take pictures of it. We find that people are sending the airfield photographs just from being on the ground when it flies over, um, which is brilliant. You know, that shows that the appetite's there for what we want to do, to, to have the historic museum. And when things do develop that way, the people will come. We're lucky here, it's absolutely stunning. The scenery is really incredible. You've got a bit of everything. You've got coastline with these amazing beaches and cliffs and you've got you know, all these lovely little islands dotted around off the coast. All these incredible castles. The hills with the Cheviots just uh, behind the airfield there as well. It's, it's really quite a stunning place to fly over. It's pretty uh, unlike anywhere else in, in England anyway. The wait for the N3N goes on, but passengers are queuing up to ride in the new plane. There's a lot of interest for it. She's still not quite ready yet, um, but uh, once, uh, once we get her up here in uh, the next few months, uh, I'm sure she's going to be kept pretty busy because she's not like everything else that you can fly, certainly up this end of the country. When they were built, heroes like Charles Lindbergh and Amy Johnson ruled the skies, but the planes of the 1930s are still writing history over Britain. Thanks to dedicated engineers, and skilled pilots.